Take it away, Michaela. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm pretty excited to have you guys joining me today. This is a topic I'm very interested in, and I have a lot of thoughts and ideas, and I, I hope that some of you at least will be able to walk away with something new. Um, this is interplanting for pollinators. Now, as Emily mentioned, I am the home horticulture agent for Talbot County, but I also coordinate the Master Gardener Program. Um, and as it is, our Master Gardener Program has a lot of different programs um, that cover a variety of topics. Obviously, I'm focusing a little bit more on pollinators today, um, but keep an eye out for some of the other programs out there and available. Certainly, we, we do cover a wide range of topics like you see in the Backyard Gardening series. So I'm going to forewarn you that I will have a lot of ideas and thoughts that might not be as popular uh, with, with the rest of the industry. Um, I'm a horticulturist, but I'm, I'm what I call a ecological horticulturist. So my main interest is in um, supporting the environment and supporting um, insects and animals and all the other wildlife that are very, very dependent on our landscapes. And so I'm going to have some ideas here, some behavioral changes that are going to be hard maybe for some people to get over because these are practices that have been in our landscapes since the beginning of, you know, maintaining your landscape. Um, so I'm going to encourage you to kind of buck the standards, so to speak. Uh, you know, I'm going to advocate for um, building more naturalized landscapes that utilize native plants. I'm going to tell you to leave plant material as long as it's not diseased. You're going to leave plant material in the garden because this is habitat, home, and food for all of our insects. Um, and I'm gonna also advocate for leaving the leaves because that's a really easy and big one that we can do. I am giving you, you can, you can tell the world, I'm giving you permission to be a lazy gardener. And actually sometimes the lazier you are, um, the more ecological you are. So you can just justify it that way. It's not lazy, it's ecological. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to leave a lot of things on site um, again, unless you're having a lot of issues with disease, then it's a little bit more of a sanitation issue. And I'm also going to encourage you um, to lose the lawn or ditch the lawn when you can. So anytime you can find a way to chip away at your lawn um, and put in natural gardens instead or, or more native plants, I'm going to encourage you to do it because the lawn is uh, an overused idea. Um, and it's a huge monoculture that really doesn't support any insect activity or it really any activity other than um, human foot traffic, which sometimes is necessary. I'm not saying get rid of all of your lawn, but maybe consider the idea of, um, of reducing it. That's a really good um, advocating quality. <clears throat> and I understand I'm going to, um, you know, talk about these ideas, but also realize that there are some HOAs out there, so homeowners associations that may not allow for some of these practices. So at the end of the day, just make sure you're checking in with um, any rules that you may have in, in your neighborhood um, that might restrict some of these practices. And, and of course, you know, we we all understand that you have to you have to follow the rules. So, but when you can, you can break them too. It's all right. Um, so here's a little inspiration. This is um, this is my property. These are all photos from my property. And I feel like I've uh, built my gardens from, from nothing. Uh, when we first moved in, there was nothing but evergreen shrubs um, and they were not native. So they really didn't um, support any insect or uh, animal activity. So all we had were these evergreen shrubs and lawn and that was it. Um, so this has been, you know, I think I'm on year seven now um, of being on our property and incorporating a lot of uh, native plants into the landscape. And it's been super encouraging because especially the last couple of years, I'm seeing a lot more um, insect activity, more pollination services, more hummingbirds, more birds in general. But then last year, I saw my first uh, wood bo uh, my box turtle, which is in the top left. That was right in the middle of, of my front gardens. So right up next to the house where you don't expect to see them. Um, and so that felt like the real uh, feather in my cap, so to speak, to um, building this kind of habitat that's going to encourage wildlife, because that's really my my ultimate goal. And sometimes using signs and, and posters um, can help your neighbors or your neighborhood understand what you're doing, even though it might look a little bit messy, more people are probably likely to accept it if they understand it's for a reason. It's not just because you left it, although sometimes I do leave it, so... All right, so um, a lot to get through today, but I, I 
just want to go back to basics. Um, when we plant with pollinators in mind, um, just keep in mind that insects have needs just like human beings. We need food, uh, we need shelter. Um, so this in interprets to insects nesting sites and overwintering habits, and they need a fresh water source. Um, so all of these um, factors is what every animal needs and nature usually provides. However, sometimes our environments, um, when they are so built up or so changed, they might not have these. So this is this is our role as human beings to be able to provide them for our wildlife. And we're also, you know, of course we love bees. In fact, bees, you know, they're my favorite, not to play favorites, but butterflies and bees are really great. They're really charismatic, but we're not just planting for them. The insect kingdom or the insect world is very vast. Um, and there's a lot of beneficial insects within that kingdom. So things we often forget about are flies, um, wasps. And when I say wasps, I don't mean the really angry yellow jackets that fly out of the ground and sting you. I'm talking about a lot of solitary or predatory wasps that actually help control pest populations. And those are the kind of wasps that we're going to attract by using the plants I'm gonna recommend. Um, and they're the ones that you really do want. They're not, they're not a threat. But also beetles. Beetles is like the largest group. Um, uh, I think it's the largest order of insects um, in, the, in the insect world. Um, and so we want to provide a, a variety of conditions in order to support all of these different insect types. And, and again, we don't often think of these as the pollinators or the beneficials, but uh, they do play a very critical role. All right, so the first thing uh, we're gonna look at is how you can provide food for pollinators. And what I will say is that um, a, a good rule to live by is that you're trying to use a lot of native plants, use as much native plants as you can, avoid invasive plants. Um, the problem I have with ornamental or invasive plants is that they often don't provide the right type of food source or enough of a food source for our pollinators. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different species that are marketed as attracting these insects, but native plants um, do the best bang for the buck. Uh, and, and almost all of my recommendations will be um, native plants, except uh, there's a few exceptions. But, um, you know, we also want to focus on plants that provide seasonal variety. So gardens should not only have seasonal variety, so you have something that's blooming, you know, all throughout the growing season, but you want different colors, you want different shapes and heights, even plant heights make a difference. Um, and then you're gonna wanna incorporate different species um, into, into this mix because you want a really good, well-rounded source of nectar and pollen at all times of the years because, um, you know, insects emerge at different times of the year. So there are some bees that emerge very early and will be foraging very early on. Um, but then as the season goes on, different species of bees will be coming out. And um, so there, there's just a, you need a varietal source of uh, plants for bees and all insects at all times of the years. And if you can avoid using pesticides in places where you've planted um, these native plants, uh, you know, if you can use alternative methods, and like I said, encouraging these natural uh, predators and parasitoids will also help control pest populations. So you don't want to kill those beneficial insects. Um, but if you do have to use a pesticide for uh, a good, good reason, you know, avoid the times of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. usually. That's when the most insect activity is occurring, um, usually in plants and in foraging. Um, and always, always follow the label accordingly. I know Emily will have said that a million times by the time you know, we're done with this year. <laughs> So when I talk about planting across the seasons, um, like I said, you want plants that are blooming because those are a nectar source. Um, using that variety of plant types, colors, and even flower shapes. Believe it or not, um, with all these different kinds of insects, their mouth parts are all different. And so um, some insects might not be able to access certain shape of flowers. Um, so by providing those different flower shapes, you're able to provide a little bit for everybody. Um, and many early season flowers actually belong to trees and shrubs. We don't often think about them um, as being a pollinator source, but um, you know this chart is fairly limited. This is a very limited amount of species, but I actually have this um, Delaware Native Plants for Native Bees booklet. 
and it has a nice seasonal chart in it. Um, and actually, the, the earlier season plants are going to be black willow, red maples, which you know have finished blooming now. Uh, but certainly, they were probably one of the earliest flowers to come out. So um, especially on these really warm days, like today, where the temperatures are soaring, and there's not a lot out and blooming yet, but there definitely are insects out foraging. So providing um, trees and shrubs that bloom early in the season will will help kind of catch you up in the in the later of the season because the perennial plants won't be blooming yet. And here's um, you know meadows are are a great idea because they do provide um, such variety. Like I said, the different heights you've got different blooms and they're all blooming at the different times and colors. So, um, you know, the more the merrier, uh, biodiversity, as I say on this page, is the spice of life. And um, so the more biodiverse you can make your environments, the more luck you'll have in attracting insects. Um, and when you can, use a regional native plant. So plants that have been either sourced or grown um, locally, because those are gonna have, those plants are gonna have the, the best resources for growing in the environment that we have here. If you are importing something from, let's say the Midwest, um, it might have great winter tolerance, but it might not be very tolerant to the humid summers that we have here in Maryland. So plants that tend to be cultivated here tend to perform better here as well. And I've got some really great recommendations. Um, the bulleted list under these points, um, they're going to be the native plants listed first and then non-natives, but also still beneficial plants are listed second. So when I talk about the carrot family, I'm talking about plants that have really teeny tiny flowers. And even though the flowers might not be large and showy, what is um, beneficial about them is they're accessible to basically all kinds of pollinators because they're they're so small and open. They don't have to have special mouth parts. Um, you know, the, the flower shape doesn't limit their access. They're just very open, very accessible. So that's why they perform so well. Also keep in mind, um, when you're planting things in the carrot family, uh, you can encourage the black swallowtail butterfly larva, which are the eggs are laid exclusively in the larva feed exclusively on these types of plants. Um, now the butterfly doesn't distinguish between, you know, feeding on anything, but they do need to lay their eggs on these types of plants. So golden alexanders is our native, um, is a native carrot. Uh, sweet Sicily, which is a less common one, but actually rattlesnake master, which is a really neat prairie plant. Um, these are all in the carrot family, whereas you know dill, carrot, parsley, fennel, those are ones you're you're going to find more easily. Um, those are mostly annual. Uh, carrot is a biennial. Fennel is a perennial, I should say. Um, but those also support the black swallowtail butterfly. So if you want the larva, those are good things to plant, especially because they're annuals. They're very easy to grow from seed. And um, you know the mint family is a very is a very large family, but uh, I've tried to narrow it down. And in fact, I forgot one critical plant on this list. So bee balms, um, lyre leaf sage, these are native ones. As is mountain mint, which is pycnanthemum, which is um, listed on some of my other slides. Those are all native, um, but there's a lot of non-native sages. So those are in the salvia group. Or Thai basil and sweet basil are really great. For some of the small pollinators, um, as is catnip. Although, as as with all members of the mint family, remember that they can wander pretty easily, so they will self seed and self grow. Um, so these are sometimes great for more limited areas where you can kind of control their growth. But certainly, nothing is going to be as popular um, as members of the mint family. And I have a couple of other uh, groups listed, the legumes and the aster family. The aster family is a huge family. Um, and this is another one where the flowers are very small and very accessible to a variety of different um, insects. So if you're limited on space, what I encourage people to do is plant a lot of things in the aster family um, and plant a lot of things in the carrot family because those are gonna be flowers that you don't need a specialized um, mouth part or, or tongue to, to access. Um, and there's just such a wide variety of plants available in those different groups as well. So if you're looking for um, bee activity, I, I pulled these from some research. Um, if you're looking for high numbers of native bees, so you're having interactions between native plants and native bees, 
Um, this is my top five list. And um, the only thing that's not native to Maryland is purple prairie clover, but it is a really cool flower. I do encourage people to grow it anyways, because it's just a really funky, neat addition to the landscape. And it's a, it's a nice color as well. Um, if you're looking for predatory wasps, so these are things that are going to um, control pest populations. You'll notice kind of a, a theme here. There's a lot of aster family in this group. So there's common bone set, rattlesnake master, mountain mints, um, and goldenrod. Uh, and then right there on the bottom of the list is milkweed, which is interesting because milkweeds also support monarch caterpillar activity as well. So anytime you can capitalize on having the most amount of species on one plant, use that plant because like I said, it gives you the most bang for your buck. And if you're limited on space, you want those plants that attract the most numbers. And here's some pictures of encouragement because I love bees. And um, the one on the top left is a longhorn bees and they are just the cutest things in the universe. Um, dare I say they're better than honeybees because they're so adorable. Uh, yeah, you get a lot of insect activity with, and these are all native plants. Um, on the top left, that's mist flower, blue mist flower, which grows just about anywhere. That's another mint family. Um, and actually these bees are, on that picture are not feeding on the flower. They're actually resting for the night. So this was in the evening. And what happens is male longhorn bees will aggregate at night to rest and they'll actually clasp the stem of the flower and rest there for, for the evening. So you'll have just these little groups of male bees clustered together. It, again, it's the cutest thing you've ever seen. So um, if you want those, you got to plant a lot of native stuff. And then we have um, red milkweed or swamp milkweed in the top right. It's a number of different bee types that will feed on that as well as, as butterflies. Certainly it's very popular with butterflies. Um, and then mountain mint is on the bottom and these are just two different um, insects just to demonstrate, you know, pollinators are not just bees and butterflies. We have um, solitary wasps. So they love mountain mint and um, the goldenrod beetle or soldier beetle is another name for it. Um, they are also really great pollinators and they are predators of, of pest species. So um, again, this is this is a type of plant that's gonna give you a lot of um, attractive qualities for insects. And those are really small flowers. I mean, they're kind of, you can see they're purple and they've got kind of a, a, a funky shape to them, but they're very small. So they're very accessible to a lot of insects. And if you're going to grow plants just for butterflies or for as a larval host, um, this is a nice list to show you what kind of species of butterfly require different. They're they're what we call specialists. So um, you know the monarch caterpillar is um, it is reliant on milkweeds as as a host plant. So um, in order to have monarchs out in the world, we also have to have milkweeds, and we have a couple of different species available. So um, you know there should be a milkweed for just about everybody. And one of my favorite is zebra swallowtail. Um, which is a host on some one of my other favorite plants, which is pawpaw. It's a native fruit tree. Okay, so um, you know other actions at home that you can do is provide the shelter, and this is a big one. This is the this is the list that's going to be the longest um, because insects nest in a variety of different ways. Um, the more variety you can provide at home, the more nesting grounds that they're able to find uh, and. And if you can provide both food and shelter in close proximity to one another, that's a real advantage because insects don't like to fly further than they have to. That's that's energy expended that um, that they need to save for reproduction and, and overwintering and things like that. So if you can provide both habitat and food on your property, um, that's that's doing the best thing. Um, soil disturbance is is a big thing we don't really think about, and and for people who who till their gardens routinely, um, this is a good message to kind of if you can let the soil go because um, not only are you disturbing the soil structure itself and all of the microbes um, and invertebrates that are in the soil, but a lot of our insects are ground nesting. So what you're actually doing is disturbing their nesting sites by tilling and disturbing the soil. Not to mention, you're gonna get a lot more weeds because um, disturbance actually brings weed seeds to the surface and then with sun, they start to germinate and yeah, you, you get the message. Some other really advantage, advantageous things to do, um, if you can, leaving snags or dead wood. 
And this is only if it's safe. Of course, if it's um, threatening a structure or if it's over a walkway where you have a lot of people coming and going, can't always leave things there. Uh, longhorn bees, mason and leafcutter bees, these are a few that lay their eggs in what we call cavities carved into um, dead wood. So fallen logs are a treasure trove for not only bee habitat, but for ground beetles, spiders, and other insect predators or natural insect predators. So um, like I said, I would recommend keeping fallen logs and dead wood if you can, but leave it well away from the house because of course we don't want to um, have any termite issues. Um, and you also don't want to leave any wood that could harbor disease or pests. So in particular, looking for pine bark beetles, emerald ash borer, anything like that. But you know, if you're ever in question, you can always clear it off the property, but um, dead wood is advantageous to have if you can. And even rocks and brush piles um, provide a lot of uh, hibernation sites. It also is kind of, they act as like bird retreats. They provide cracks and crevices um, for insects, for nesting sites. So they can be either structural where you can actually try and give it like an aesthetic look. Um, but you, you can also just leave it as a pile. You know, I, I, I have what I call my lazy compost pile, which is basically a pile of sticks on the edge of my woods. And I pretend that me doing that is just providing a, a brush pile that's habitat for insects. So, um, you know, freshwater sources um, also benefit from having some small rocks or pebbles in the, the freshwater source because this is a good landing site for insects to drink. Um, if there's no place for the insect to land, um, it's hard for them to, to access that fresh water. So we don't often think about that. Um, you know, some of these bigger pools or lakes uh, might be difficult for insects to gain access to. And one of the big things we can do is saving the stems of our perennials. Um, number one, we tend to cut our plants back way too early. We cut them down in the fall. Um, and honestly, we're, we're missing out on all the benefits of having perennial plants uh, by cutting them down in the fall. You should be leaving them until about March. Um, and then when you do cut them, if you can leave them on site, that's even better because that's where a lot of your ca other cavity nesting bees are going to be um, leaving their eggs and their young. And then finally, um, you know, mulching consciously. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means, but mostly it means um, leaving the leaves or using a mulch that is made up of organic matter. All right, so my ground nesting bees. Uh, so bees are, can be divided into a couple of different groups. Honeybees, they tend to be more of what we call a colony. They are what we call social insects. So they require having a queen um, and then all of the progeny around her um, support her activity in laying, laying eggs. And, and they're all very interconnected. Now, a lot of our native bees are not uh, social insects like that. They're what we call either solitary. So that means they kind of live on their own. Um, they lay their own eggs. They do their mating. They don't need an entire colony to support them. Or they're what we call eusocial, which is where you might have a, a, a bunch of queens or a bunch of females um, that sort of nest and aggregate together, but they don't, they aren't necessarily reliant on one another. So they don't share those um, activities like honeybees do. And that being said, um, that means they require a different kind of nesting habits. So a lot of our insects or bees are ground nesting. So this is where they tunnel um, underground or they have chambers underground. Remember what I was talking about with um, not disturbing the soil? This is where this kind of comes into play. Uh, by disturbing the soil, you could be destroying these tunnels or these underground chambers. Um, and this makes up 70% of our native bees. That's a, that's a big chunk of bees. Um, and, and other things to keep in mind, uh, a lot of our beetles are ground nesting as well. So they rely on leaf litter and undisturbed soil um, in order to lay eggs, you know, go through their larval stage, and then be, go through what we call pupating, um, which is basically like you know, when they go from larva to adult. So it's a complete um, change that they have to go through. And they need a safe space to do that. So um, leaf litter and undisturbed soil is, is great for that. And then we have what we, we more are aware of, our cavity nesting bees. So this is 30% of the group. Um, leaf cutter and mason bees, these are, are things you're going to find either in cavities in wood or in the stems of plants, which I have in the next slide. Uh, but you can also just provide a wooden block with holes drilled in it. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I think I have some other pictures coming up, but you know, like 
they can be sold. You'll see them in the stores, of course, um, like Mason Bee Houses, where they look a little bit nicer and um, they can be used. But as Emily pointed out to me earlier, um, be sure that you have a way to either sanitize um, the house in between broods. So that would be probably done in the summer after the bees have emerged and they've flown off. Um, or you have to throw the structure away and have a completely new one ready for them in the fall. So um, there's a lot of good instruction for how to do that. And look at that the cute little bee butt. Um, so this is um, obviously a stem of some kind of hollowed um, hollowed stem, so some kind of perennial, and the insect's actually starting to build its brood chambers inside the stem. Um, and this graphic on the right, it might be a little bit difficult to read or to see, but this is from the Xerxes Society, and it's the best graphic I've been able to find to instruct on how to leave stems, because it's not enough just to leave the stems over winter, cut them down, and then remove them. You have to leave the stems on site for a certain amount of time, because, like I said, you still have the larvae and um, the egg broods inside of those um, stems. So you want to essentially leave them, cut them high, you know, like 10 to 24 inches, um, and then leave those stems on site in order for them to actually be utilized. And they break down over time. They aren't there forever. I know they seem very woody and very tough, but they actually do break down fairly quickly, um, especially if they're getting used like this. And here's a good example. This is kind of a cross section. Um, and I actually think that's a carpenter bee. So it's a very sizable bee. You can actually see um, the different life stages of the bee inside a hollow stem. And this is why we wanna leave the stems is because you might not realize how much activity is occurring inside. Um, and then on the right is a picture of a mason bee. So these are much smaller than honeybees, but they're one of our native bees. And it actually will seal off the end of the hollow tube with mud. And that's how you can kind of tell that there's gonna, that there's something still in there is if the mud is still intact. Um, now, if the mud has broken away, there's a hole and it looks empty, then it's probably safe um, to toss that bamboo pole or that stem or whatever. And you can um, give them something new for the following season. But there are some plants that are better or they have pithy stems. So that means they're just kind of hollow on the inside. It's easier for insects to lay eggs in them. Um, and we have a lot of really good native options for that. Um, what I don't want you to do is run out and plant bamboo. Harvesting bamboo is great. You can use those um, for these kinds of bee houses that you find in the store on your own, whatever. Um, but don't go and plant bamboo because it's a very invasive plant. Uh, likewise, Japanese knotweed, princess tree, and there are some other invasive plants that have really hollow stems. Um, but don't plant those on purpose because those are really um, detrimental. Um, you know, go with plants that are on the left that provide you um, with a native group of plants that do the same thing. And here's some more examples of um, you know cavity nesting uh, ideas. You can just take a log and drill holes in it. Um, this is great kind of structure for the garden too. It can be almost like a sculpture, especially if you have a really um, nice piece of dead wood. Um, you can make it a little bit more formal where it's like a wooden block. Um, what I do encourage you to do is like they do in the picture on the right where you have the block full of holes, it's up against a structure because what happens is some um, predators or parasitoids can actually come around the backside of these nesting structures and um, will pilfer the, the larvae and the eggs from, um, from the holes. So if you have a solid back against it, um, there's much less likely that they'll, they'll take them out. Um, and you can even do a really simple uh, activity like the bamboo circle on the bottom. Um, I would just encourage you to clean out the bamboo or use new bamboo every summer. If you do this, this is a great project to do with kids and to hang it up um, from a tree limb or it can even just get set on the ground or on a pile of wood, whatever. It's, it's very flexible, very easy to do. And here is my little public service announcement about leaving the leaves um, <clears throat> and not just leaving them, but uh, leaving them intact, which means you are not grinding them up. Now, the exception to this rule might be some um, oak leaves. Like if oak leaves don't break down after a certain amount of time, 
it's probably okay to start chopping them up just because otherwise they'll they'll smother everything else. But a lot of the other leaves do not need to be chopped up. I know it's hard to believe when you have a huge pile of leaves in the fall that it's going to break down, but leaves break down super quickly. I think Emily can back me up on this. Um, so they break down super quickly. They aren't going to stay there forever. Uh, and there's so much microbial activity in the soil and insect activity that they break down even faster than if you had like a pile of leaves inside your house. Um, so, you know, have faith. And um, the leaves are such a great source of habitat for insects. I don't know if you can pick out the creature that is located in the picture in the upper left. It's actually a, a small red bat, which is one of our native bat species. Sometimes they will hibernate or they'll accidentally fall into leaf litter. And um, if they aren't very active, they'll just sit in the leaf litter. So by either clearing the leaves away or chopping up the leaves, um, you, you want to avoid chopping up little red bats too. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of other insects that use leaves to make a cocoon. So this is one of my favorite moths of all time. This is the, the one of the giant silk moths, which is Luna. Um, but all the other silk moths also use this same technique where they will actually wrap their cocoon in leaves. And that's to not only camouflage themselves, um, but it also protects the cocoon a little bit. So uh, you never know what kind of things you could be clearing away by removing all of those leaves. Uh, and what I would encourage is to use those leaves to put them into garden beds if you can, or find a location where it's okay to leave the leaves. Certainly around, um, you know, under the trees is a great idea. Grass doesn't grow real great under big shade trees anyways. So maybe you can start to make a bed with leaves and under that drip line. Um, there's all sorts of ways to kind of incorporate leaves into the environment. Also, like I said, they will break down very quickly. So while it seems like you have a lot at the end of the season, um, have faith that they do, they do break down. And then kind of like the last um, thing I'm going to uh, talk about before I talk about some more plants is ground beetles or, what, or something we call beetle banks. Now, this is more of a technique used in agricultural practices, um, but I think it can still apply to the home garden. And I think I'm going to try incorporating one into my own property um, this year. So beetle banks are um, mounded soil rows and they're usually, let me go back. So ground beetles and other predatory beetles uh, are very voracious predators in both their larval and their adult form. So harboring a perennial habitat for them is essential. Um, it, it can be used as part of a biocontrol program for agricultural fields, but like I said, I think it could also go in the backyard. So these beetle banks are mounded um, soil that you actually plant grasses and native perennials right into. Um, and the idea is that this is undisturbed habitat refuge for, for the beetles. You can use wildflowers to attract pollinators in addition to some of the ground dwelling insects, um, but your proportion of flowers to grasses depends on both your desire for seeing flowers and um, the desire for more pollinator activity. So like in an agricultural field, if they needed more pollinator services, they would probably incorporate more flowers into the beetle banks. Um, but if they were just building a beetle bank, you could do it with just grasses or even sedges. Sedges are also a really great option. So these bunch grasses provide overwintering shelter that the beetles need, um, as well as access to bare soil that is in between or under um, the leaves of the grasses. And um, the reason these beetle banks exist or people actually plant them is because beetles require a lot of time to complete their life cycle. Like I'm talking years. Um, so, the, you know, they're not always insects that have a quick life cycle and then they die. You know, they could pupate up to several years. Um, so if we're disturbing the soil and uh, or rigging the leaf litter away and taking away um, the larva and the pupas, we, we won't get the adult beetles, which are where a lot of our services come from. You know, that's why it's really important to have this established perennial habitat for them. And it's also really important to avoid the use of pesticides um, in this specific area, uh, because what you're doing is essentially you're, you're killing your predators and, and your beneficial insects. You're not necessarily killing um, the pest species. So, um, you know, you, you'd want to avoid using pesticide in these areas if you can. And here's a nice um, little cross section of what 
a beetle bank looks like they're they're often made they're like a berm and now you don't have to have a mounded bank or a berm it's not necessary with soils that are well drained but of course we live on the eastern shore um, maybe some of you have sandier soil than I do, but I certainly do not have good drainage. So banked soils not only help keep it drier, but it also provides a warmer habitat. So that soil actually warms more quickly and provides earlier season activity because it stays warmer. Um, and you'll notice that uh, these can be furrowed linearly with crop rows in a field. Um, but they are not tilled or disturbed. So obviously um, the, they're meant to be a refuge, um, not only for insects, but also it's permanent habitat for these insects. That's all I have about beetle banks, but I'm, I'm happy to answer some more questions if you have them. Now, um, if we have time, I can go through some like recommended species for pollinators real quickly. Um, and these will vary depending on your condition types. So, um, you know, for, for areas where it's very wet, Joe pie weeds are a great addition. Um, they tend to get a little bit taller, but uh, bone set, which is Eupatorium fistulosum, is, is one of my favorite. And that one only gets to be about two and a half, three feet tall. And likewise, blue vervain or, or verbena is um, a high wi wildlife attractant uh, plant. So it's not just insects, but uh, also very popular with birds as a, as a food source because they produce a lot of seeds. Um, for areas that tend to be mostly wet, sometimes they can be dry. Um, switch grasses do really well, actually, and they have a lot of those hollow stems we talked about. Um, so they're, and they're a very robust um, kind of grass species. Um, and likewise, bee balm, just like its name implies, is very popular with pollinators. Might be one of the, like, I think it is one of the top five plants for insect activity, in particular bees. Um, and it's one of my favorite plants. It's also got a really cool flower petal that's very long and tubular. Um, and you'll find that uh, if you plant some of the red bee balms, you'll get a lot of hummingbird activity. They, they really love these kinds of plants. And then as we're looking for more like average soils um, or average to dry, we, there's um, Maryland wild senna or is, uh, is a legume. So not only is it fixing nitrogen in the soil, but it also provides this really large flower stalk um, that's very popular with pollinators. And if you can plant an aster on your property, do it because it's one of the most beneficial um, wildlife plants that you can have. It also provides a late season um, nectar source for insects that are about to go into hibernation or diapause. And then Indian grass is, is another tall grass. Um, but it um, it gets a little too tall for the home garden for me. But you'll see it in a lot of conservation landscape planting because it has a lot of um, benefits to it as well. And it's a beautiful color. But if you want a grass for the home landscape, Emily knows I can't help myself. I got to talk a little bit about grasses. Little blue stem, which is the grass in the middle, is a great addition for the home garden. It stays very upright. Um, it's got hollow stems as well but it also has a lot of attractive uh, winter color. So it'll be this orangey red color in the fall. Um, and of course, if you can include a uh, milkweed in your landscape, the butterfly weed in this picture is better for dry landscapes or dry soils, as is um, this black-eyed Susan, which is Rudbeckia herda. But again, there's a lot of different kinds of black-eyed Susans or Rudbeckias. So you should be able to find one that fits your landscape, um, you know, whether it's wet or dry or whatever. And then for super dry environments, um, these are some recommendations. I have uh, purple love grass, which is on the left, might be another really great grass. Uh, this would be good for like beetle banks um, if that's something you decided you'd want to try because it can handle being super dry. Um, it and uh, you'll even find it on the roadsides, like it's in it's in the crappiest soil out there, um, and it's got these really pretty purple seed heads in the fall. Um, nodding onion, again, also really likes dry environments. And um, it's like a, it's a native herb. And so native herbs, herbs tend to attract a lot of insect activity as well. So they're, they're quite fragrant and not just because of the onion smell, but the flowers themselves are also fragrant. Um, and then the little grass that's on the far right, this is called Cydotes grandma. It's a, it's a very short grass. So again, this would be a really great 
plant for like a beetle berm or for an area that you don't want grasses getting too high, it's maybe about a foot tall, even with the flowering stalk. Um, and that's if you don't mow it. So, so this is one of those grasses you could leave, but it also prefers a very, very dry environment. And I think that kind of wraps things up. Yeah, perfect on time. So we're at 45 minutes, but um, I'm anticipating some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Michaela. That was amazing and great. So we do have some questions. So um, obviously we've got a resource list on the screen right now, but you had someone ask about where they could find some of these native plant lists. I think the very oh. first one that you had up. Um, oh, sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also happy to to share like the charts that are from the slides, if that's helpful. Because I think sometimes seeing those really long lists are too overwhelming. That's why I like my little short and condensed list of, you know, the yeah. plants that do the best. But I'm happy to share those if, if you want to send them out to participants. I don't know if that's possible. Yep. If you uh, don't mind sending us a PDF of your presentation, we'll send that out to everyone sure. so everyone can have the list that you had. Um, sure. So the next question we had are, are mints and basil perennials? Nah, uh, basil, no. Some mints, no. Um, but mint is a very large family. So there are some mints that, yes, are perennial. In fact, I think like lemon balm tends to be perennial, even though it's, I think it's supposed to be an annual. But um, yeah, it really, and it really just depends on kind of the microclimate too, especially if uh, if you're on the lower shore, you're, you're closer to like zone eight. Um, there's a lot of things that might be able to overwinter and survive, but like salvias are, are supposed to be annual, uh, and, and but some people are able to make them overwinter. You don't, you okay. can have a mix. In fact, it's I encourage a mix of both perennial and annual if you can if you can do it. Yeah, I will say a lot of my mints and where I am in Cambridge are all in containers, and most of them manage to overwinter. Yeah. pretty well so both culinary ones and like my bee balm and stuff like that have overwintered in containers so yeah I did um, Thai basil last year and it did not survive but it did last very long into the season longer than I thought it would so it's all changing <laughs> yeah. so uh what do you think about flowering cherry trees mm -hmm. as an early blooming tree for pollinators um, and if not do you have a native that you would recommend instead yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so what I will say is a lot of the commercially available cherry trees, like the the Kwanzaa cherry and the, the like double bloom cherry trees, those are not friendly to pollinators um, because they have been bred for their appearance rather than their substance. Um, the double blooming in particular, it's almost like you've taken away the access to um, the pollen and the flower itself. So what I would encourage is to look at like native cherry options. We have a pin cherry, uh, black cherry is one of like the top plants for, for many insects. Prunus serotina, I think. But, uh, you know, we even have flowering crab apples that perform better than, than a lot of those flowering cherry trees do. And those might be my preference if you're going to choose like an ornamental plant is, is probably the crab apples. But we have a lot of spring flowering plants, um, the red buds which are just popping here in Easton, uh, those are great. Let me think. Black locust is, is a great for pollinators, but it's not necessarily a very strong tree. So some people don't like um, using it, but there's a lot of flowering plants. Look, look for our native cherries. Those are gonna be really beneficial. And then they also have fruits for the birds later in the season. Awesome. And no matter what, avoid Bradford pears. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, yeah. You're right. Bradford pears, please do not plant. No. Um, uh. Although you will notice Bradford pears, they their flowers really stink. Like, like they are not attractive in terms of smell, but that could be because they are trying to attract flies instead, because a lot of the stinky flowers um are, are more catered to the fly group, which is attracted to, to smelly things. So if you want a bunch of flies, maybe plant Bradford pears. <laughs> you know, that's I, not scientifically no. proven, but <laughs> there's, there's better plants to attract flies that's than right, Bradford that's pears. Right. Don't plant Bradford pears. Um, so speaking of plants that you said not to plant. So one person asked about clumping bamboo as opposed to running bamboo. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say no bamboos. <laughs> oh, yeah. We do have, I think, I think we have a native bamboo. It's extremely rare. You're not going to find it for sale anywhere. And even if you did, I would question its source. Um, 
yes, I would say avoid bamboo, period. We have a lot of other native plants to choose from. You do. So uh, what are your thoughts about zinnias? Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, zinnias are great. I think um, what's important to keep in mind is I'm, I'm not trying to demonize any plants that are not native, although, you know, I, I do feel biased. Um, but I think it's just important to know you need a mix of everything. Um, so I wouldn't plant just zinnias for as a pollinator garden. You need a little bit more than that. But zinnias, zinnias are great. Um, and I know the butterflies go crazy for them. Um, so certainly it's it's nice to be able to plant something that has a lot of color, but I would intersperse it with um, a lot of other like native plants that are going to be there more permanently um, and still have a lot of benefits to them. So yeah, don't, don't, don't feel ashamed of zinnias. Those are great. Mm -hmm. So along that line, someone asked about recommendations for plants that could get put in a raised bed alongside vegetables. So like companion planting. Yep. So that's where... Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I don't mean to make you sick, but I'm going to go all the way back. That's why, um, you know, a lot of these um, things I recommended as secondary, so like the second bullet is, are things that could go into the vegetable garden. So um, while you may think we harvest the carrot, that's great. But even if you wanted to let that carrot go to seed or go to flower, um, the flowers have a lot of benefits. So that's why I mentioned things in the dill family and parsley. Um, and like I said, uh, a lot of sages are not native, but they have some really great flowers, um, as do Thai basil or sweet basil. So these are all things that can go right in the vegetable garden because a lot of them are annuals anyways. Um, and the same thing goes for legumes. There's a lot of um, ornamental legumes out there like purple hyacinth beans, sweet peas, um, or even just your regular um, pea pods. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what advice can you offer for folks who might be concerned about attracting stinging insects? Oh, what a great question. So what I will say is that you are more at risk of getting stung by a honeybee or um, yellow jackets than you are any of the insects I mentioned today. Um, our, our native insects are, again, are solitary insects, and they are much less likely to sting. And in fact, many of them don't even have stingers, and, and they're much less likely to sting unless you grab them in your hand and held them in your hand. Uh, you you would not get stung by any and uh, and uh, same goes for like the predatory wasps. They're not interested in you. They aren't social. They're solitary, so they aren't really protecting like a nest or anything. They're just kind of going about their business, um, and they have much bigger things to worry about, like like eating. <laughs> but I will say, you know, yellow jackets. Um, yeah, I understand the concern with those, but really. Um, None of these plants is going to attract more yellow jackets than than are already out there. Um, so, you know, using your normal caution with um, flying insects is always a good thing. But I've never been bothered by any native insect. OK, and, then and I, I don't, Emily, you might you might have more advice than than I had on that. No, but. I think that's pretty good. Most of the times when it concerns the singing insects, I tend to tell people like now is the time to sort of keep an eye out for particularly things like the yellow jackets and paper wasps that are building nests around your home. Um, and if it's someplace right in a doorway or right near foot traffic, you may want to go ahead and take care of it. But if there's a yellow jacket nest in the tree in the corner of your yard and no one really wanders over there, you're probably okay. They tend to not get too aggressive unless you are poking at them or so forth. So I think generally speaking, you're going to be okay. Those wasps, why we are often fearful about getting stung are also really good natural enemies in our garden because particularly near the end of the season so like midsummer for to the fall they're hunting down small caterpillars because they're trying to feed their potentially overwintering queen as much protein as they can um so generally speaking i wouldn't be too worried about it i actually think you may be more likely to come across things like yellow jackets if you have a lot of turf grass because a lot of them are ground nesting ones um so yeah that would be my thoughts on it you can always check hgic which is the university of maryland's home and garden information center for more information about things like wasps um, we've got a, a ton of information there so along that line i also had someone ask about mosquitoes and tall grasses um like the two being related to one another yeah like oh um, no, you shouldn't have any higher incident incidents of mosquitoes with tall grasses. You're going to have higher instances of mosquitoes with um, water. 
So as, but in particular freshwater. So if you do have like a freshwater source, um, make sure you're cleaning it out every like couple of days or so. Um, or if you're going to go on vacation, empty it and, and just leave it empty for the time being. Um, and it's all of the like junky stuff in your yard that gathers uh, water. So, you know, I have kids, so I get toys left out in the yard all the mm -hmm. time. And when it rains, those toys gather water. And if I don't clean them out or dump them out, um, that's where you're going to find mosquito habitat. Um, and same goes with bird baths. So just making sure that you're either getting rid of that water or or you're cleaning it routinely. Um, and if you do have something like a big bird bath um, that has water in it and you're gonna be gone, you could always use a mosquito dunk. Um, and those are, they're, they use a type of bacterium um, that affects only the mosquito larva, not the birds. So it, it shouldn't affect anything except um, mosquito larva that are living in that water if that makes sense. Awesome. So, but okay. that's a really good question. And, and one I forgot to address when I talked about a freshwater source. Yep. And then I see, and I apologize if I pronounce this wrong. Um, Omatera, you've got your hand raised. So if you want to unmute and ask your question, you can. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to say thank you for the presentation. And um, I like your idea of being a, a lazy gardener. That seemed to describe yeah. me perfectly. <laughs> Good. Uh, but I have a concern um, about tall grass, living, just living in the yard. Like right now I have a ton of purple blooming plants. I don't know mm -hmm. what those are, but I'm glad to let the insects enjoy. I actually yeah. gave my neighbor an excuse at the time. I said, oh, I'm feeding the bees is why we haven't cut That's the lawn. That's right. But my lawnmower was broken, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that worked out. Anyway, so my concern is this. I know for sure that I have some voles in my garden. And I also, uh, I also can stand snakes. Oh, so yeah. living tall grasses is going to encourage them. So it's like I'm between a hard place and a rock, if that's how it's said. Yeah. Well, and you know, in, in those circumstances, yeah, you might want, not want to plant as thickly. Um, in, in that kind of area, you may be able to separate the plants a little bit more. So there's a little bit more space because they're less likely to um, kind of be out in the open. Um, but they're mostly going to be attracted to whatever it is they're hunting, um, and and hope and that's usually mice. So if you can discourage mice in your garden, that also um, can kind of help keep the snakes away. It also kind of helps maintain uh, the tick population if 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 that's an issue. But um, tall grasses aren't specifically linked to um, snakes. I mean, I see them in the lawn too. Um, so I would just say, you know trying to keep more space in between plants. Um, and if you are going to have grasses, you know, keep them in an area where you're okay with snakes being like far away from the house. <laughs> I understand the concern. Um, but yeah, this is this, this, that's a that's a good and, and that's sometimes is what happens when you attract wildlife is you get all of the wildlife. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I once dug a hole to plant a tomato and a snake jumped out. No, stop it. You're and we both went in the same direction. <laughs> Imagine. Oh yeah. my gosh. Thank I will you. I will say I have a fair amount of native grasses in my kind of pollinator native bed, thanks to Michaela. And the only snakes I've ever found have either been on my sidewalk basking in the sun or in the mulchy area. Um, around my vegetable plants. So I've yet to find, I mean, maybe they're living in the grassy area and then moving out, but generally speaking, snakes are another one of those really beneficial things that we generally want to encourage in our garden. So um, they're, as, as you said, when it popped out, it ran as well. So it's probably just as scared as you, as you are of it. So yeah, that's what I heard. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you know, um, an idea just occurred to me, especially because you mentioned like moles and voles, they also don't like to dig or to be around um, any rocky material. So mm. maybe what you do is you edge your gardens with like two to three inches in of, of like a rock mulch. Um, and, and generally I don't recommend rock mulch because it doesn't break down, but that might kind of reduce that activity because both moles, voles, and I think snakes do not like to um, go across the, the rock surface because it's too rough. 
So that might be a technique um, people can try. You should report back if you try that. I'd, I'd love mm -hmm. to hear if that if that helps at all. Okay, I sure will. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And then we had someone ask about um, rain gardens and mm. what sort of like plants would be appropriate um, and or what sort of designs. Oh, great question. Um, and we could do a whole talk on rain gardens. But what, what I would say is um, you can find a, a free copy of it's called Rain Gardens Across Maryland. And I'll, I'll type it into the box real quick across Maryland. And you can find it as a um, as a PDF online, but they also have hard copies sometimes available at extension offices. Uh, that goes through not only calculating the design for a rain garden, but it does have recommended plants for them. Um, another one I really like, and I think it's also a PDF online, is it's called the Green Book for the Buffer. Um, it has an entire section with just landscape designs for rain gardens. Um, and I find it really helpful and very useful. Um, and these, and it uses, I think all native plants, all of them are native plants. Um, but both of those books are really great resources if you're looking to get more into the rain garden game. Um, and I've put, thank you, Emily. Yep, for I've put URLs these. for both in the link or in the chat box for anyone who is interested. Yeah, really great know. questions. I, I, I really appreciate all the wonderful questions. I appreciate you all um, bearing with me. And uh, if there are any other questions, you can always reach out and contact me. I'm putting my email in the chat box. Um, I'm happy to talk about any other topic. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone has any other questions, you can put them in there. I'm also going to do a shout out to the fact that Michaela and I are two thirds of the Garden Time podcast, which is a monthly podcast that we do via extension. And we do have episodes about things like snakes and bats and rain gardens. We had Jen Denitra come on and talk about setting up rain barrels for one episode. Um, we do lots and lots of stuff about native plants and pollinators and all of that stuff. Um, our last episode was with Paul Genninger of the Ag Law Initiative, and he talked about the new bill that just passed, I think either this year or last year, that basically allows you to plant native plants even if you have an HOH, which is kind of cool. So anyone who likes podcasts and likes this kind of stuff, uh, check us out, if, especially if you liked Michaela's and mine voices today. <laughs> Um, well, so, podcasts are great because as you get out into the yard now that it's warm, it's easy to listen to podcasts as you work. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So I'm not seeing any other questions um, coming in. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Hopefully you guys will come back in two weeks where Haley Satter is going to be talking about fruit production in your yard. I think specifically strawberries and small fruit, um, but awesome. hopefully you guys will come back and join us in two weeks and get out there and enjoy this nice weather. I think it's supposed to be like upper seventies into the eighties, depending on where you are in Maryland today. So that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I know. Happy, and yet, happy gardening, everybody. This is yeah. the weather. <laughs> but yet it's still getting like down into the 30s at night. So don't put out your tomatoes oh, yet. That's true. I know. Yeah. I'm so ready for my tomatoes to go out. And I'm like, don't put them out yet, Emily. Don't put them out. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day.